By expanding its borders along the Mediterranean, is Europe outsourcing its border control to African countries to save the lives of migrants or to protect the European way of life? Hello and welcome to Bigger Than Five with me, Rida Fakhri. Faced with pressure from humanitarian organizations, five members of the European Union agreed this week to accept migrants rescued at sea. This, while the European Commission has come under criticism earlier this month for creating the position of vice president for, quote, protecting our European way of life. Since 2015, the EU has been paying some African countries to keep migrants away. As part of a so-called externalization policy, the EU offered the government of Niger $635 million with a view to passing a law that criminalizes migrant smuggling. It's working with Morocco on a $150 million border control program. It is financing the Libyan Coast Guard to intercept migrant boats. And it is now finalizing an agreement with Rwanda to accept hundreds of migrants currently held in Libyan detention centers. And individual European countries are also playing a role. Italy has been accused of paying off militias in Libya to fend off migrants. Just last month, it passed a law threatening rescue teams with fines and detention. But some European humanitarian groups have remained defiant. To me, it's important to help migrants because migrants are people like everyone else. to make a distinction uh, between a migrant or a refugee or someone with a European passport or someone who's coming out of Libya, um, to me is unfair, it's an injustice. And the reason I think that this is one of the biggest emergencies of our time, but also one of the most neglected, is uh, because of this inherent racism. Europe is closing its borders, external borders, uh, to any newcomers at all costs, even if it means that people die, and even if it means that they wait floating around in the Mediterranean for 17 days. I definitely don't agree that EU uh, policy of externalization to North African states is working. The only reason that we see fewer people arriving to European shores is because it is more difficult for people to reach Europe alive. The cost of this supposed success of this policy is human life. We don't actually know how many people are attempting this crossing, how many people are still drowning. Um, we know that the death rate has risen, even though the absolute number of arrivals to Europe has fallen. Um, and that is a, a damning indictment of European migration policy, because it means that people are less likely to be found alive while trying to seek safety all for the sake of border control. There are many things that the European Union can do to change this situation. The first is to stop criminalizing people who are fleeing. The second is to stop criminalizing those who rescue them or show solidarity or provide them with services. Another very clear demand is that the European Union stops funding and supporting, training, legitimizing this so-called Libyan Coast Guard, who consistently violate international laws, who illegally return people to a place where we know there is civil war and where we know they will likely face persecution and death. And a final demand is for the European Union to resume a state-led rescue operation in the Mediterranean and to take up its legal obligations towards people at its external borders. So then, what legal and humanitarian obligations does Europe have in managing migrants' flow? And is externalizing border control to Africa the way forward? To discuss, I'm joined by one of the people driving European policy, Witold Wasztykowski. He was Polish Minister of Foreign Affairs from 2015 to 2018 and is now a member of the European Parliament. Thank you very much indeed for joining us from Brussels. Uh, the EU, as you know, has clearly been hardening its position towards migrants. It has also been trying to harden its borders along the southern Mediterranean by essentially outsourcing border control to third part parties, primarily the Libyan Coast Guard. Your country, Poland, has been playing an instrumental role in pushing these policies and shaping them. Do you think they're working? 
Well, first, uh, let me tell you that we are not harding our uh, policy towards migrants. We are just trying to clarify and uh, define. The second, we have to look at the migrant issue from uh, 360 uh, degrees. Uh, there are migrants coming to Europe from the south, uh, from the northern part of Africa or Middle East, but there are migrants and refugees also coming to Europe from the eastern part of Europe, from Ukraine, Donbas uh, and other areas uh, under control of, of Russia. So we have to, to have a balanced approach to this issue. Sure, but you, you haven't taken a balanced approach, have you? Because you've accepted some two million migrants uh, we, from we Ukraine, have, whereas you have stated have, very clearly when you were foreign minister, you said that you're willing to take yeah. migrants from Ukraine and from Belarus and other countries, but you will not take any migrants from North Africa and the Middle East. This is what you said. You said we do not participate in the mandatory process of relocation of migrants coming from the Middle East and exactly. Africa. So essentially, exactly. this is not a balanced policy, is it? This is a balanced policy because uh, we are taking migrants from uh, eastern part of Europe. That's why, because the others are not taking. The migrants are coming to Poland and they they stay in, in, in Poland. We have about 2 million uh, Ukrainians, as you rightly uh, mentioned. About uh, 700 of them legally work, they pay taxes. The others also work temporarily. So we are not taking other uh, migrants from the other countries, other continents, because we have enough already migrants from the eastern part of, uh, of Europe. The other problem is that the uh, possibility to, uh, to take migrants is regulated by the market, by possibility to give them a job and by demography. And we reach our limits uh, right now. Uh, the next issue is, of course, the issue of uh, culture and uh, identity, national identity, cultural identity, religious identity. You cannot accept migrants from all over the world because uh, in many cases they do not uh, assimilate. So you have to be sure for security reason and for the identity reason of, of your own culture, of your, con, of your own country, that migrants who are uh, allowed to emigrate to, to, to our country may stay and immigrate with our society. We have a very bad uh, experience uh, in other countries, especially Western countries, where migrants from Africa and uh, Middle East well, Mr. do not assimilate. So this is the problem. This is precisely <coughs> the problem that many human rights organizations see they call these policies inherently racist. It sounds like uh, President Trump here in the United States saying he'll be happy to take migrants from Norway, but not from African countries. Your own prime minister said this quite bluntly. He said, we want to reshape Europe and we want to re-Christianize Europe. Isn't this all about fear mongering for political purposes? Are you seriously suggesting that migrants are threatening the European way of life? Yes, and you look at the situation in the United Kingdom, in France, in Italy, in Germany, you have, uh, you have these problems. Uh, th there is no racist policy. This is just a policy which uh, has to take, take uh, note of the, of the differences. There are differences between continents, be between uh, regions, and uh, we cannot turn whole Europe into Asian Peninsula or, uh, or African island. Uh, we spent generations to build Europe. Uh, Europe uh, culture is built on uh, ancient uh, Greek uh, uh, art and philosophy, on uh, Roman uh, law and Christianity, and we want to keep it this way. Well, precisely, after World War II, uh, Mr. Vashtikovsky, Europe was happy to take in those dark-skinned migrants from Africa to rebuild, and then it didn't seem that anyone was looking at this issue as a threat to national security or as a threat to the European way of life. Now, if, you, if, we, if we look at the size and uh, the scope of this uh, phenomenon, we are talking right now about hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people. <clears throat> so this is a new phenomenon which is threatening the security and this is threatening the uh, European way of life. Maybe you are aware that uh, recently we decided to build a new commission, European Commission, and one of the commissioner will be in charge of the protection of a uh, European way of, of life. This is, of course, questioned by some leftist organizations or leftist politicians, but if we want to keep our, our identity, as I mentioned, the legal, cultural, religious identity, we have to be very cautious. But what about your legal obligations, not to mention the moral values that the European Union and its member states often uh, say that they stand for? What about the legal obligations of not turning away migrants who are desperately mm. fleeing and situations of wars and persecution? Can you say that the situation in Libya 
from where many of these migrant, migrants try to flee have, is not one of those desperate situations? Well, first of all, we as Poland and many other European countries, we are not responsible for things which uh, are going right now in, in Libya or other parts of Middle East or Africa. Poland was never an imperialistic country, was never colonized uh, uh, any other. Uh, so that's the one, one uh, uh, question. The second question is, yes, we do respect legal obligation uh, for the political refugees and those who are threatened and persecuted by, by war or those who are engaged in political activities in other countries may apply for political asylum in any European country, also in Poland. You say that they are free to come to Europe, but clearly Poland is not doing its bit to accept these asylum seekers because your own National Office for Foreigners has said that they are being turned away and their applications are being looked at unfairly. When you were foreign minister, your government stated that safe and humane conditions should be created in some of these quote unquote reception facilities outside the EU. Do you seriously believe that these conditions are created in Libya, where, as you know, it's a failed state with no central authority and well-documented human rights violations? I don't know right now because I'm not the minister anymore, but uh, maybe you're right, they are severe conditions because recently the European Union countries and uh, UN decided to, uh, to, to take uh, thousands of uh, African uh, migrants from Libya and relocate them to Rwanda and other countries. So that's probably uh, you're right that the conditions are quite bad. But this is not our responsibility because to, to, to be responsible for these conditions in, in, in Libya. And this is not our responsibility to, to bring them all to, to Europe. Are you, are you willing to share the burden, though, with other EU member states? Of because right we, now we the there is a preliminary agreement going on between five EU countries to take in some migrants on a voluntary basis. Will you take any in? It's very likely that Polish government will participate in this uh, sharing of the burden uh, financially, just like we uh, were taking part in the agreement of European Union with Turkey. And for Turkey, the whole European Union, also Poland, decided to assign almost uh, 6 billion euros to, uh, to support the uh, life of uh, mostly re uh, Syrian refugees. So, yes, many countries uh, will participate in these funds, different funds. All right, financial support, financial but nothing support, else. Yes. Uh, let me finally ask you, uh, this is a quote from Pope Francis uh, just last week. He says, welcome, protect, promote and integrate migrants and refugees. By the sound of it, you disagree with the Pope? No, the, Pope Francis visited us uh, during the summer of 2016. Uh, and uh, I, I, I just uh, were there in Krakow and had the chance to, to listen to him and pray with him together. And I remember that he mentioned there are different ways to support and help and assist uh, migrants and refugees, different ways. Sure, but he didn't that talk about his, financial uh, support. Opinion, and we follow he, this he, part. He says, in a different he way says countries support. need to welcome, protect, promote and integrate migrants uh, he and said refugees. That he, he said also, and we, we accepted, as I mentioned at the beginning of our interview, about two million people from, from Ukraine and other Eastern, Eastern countries. And they are here in Poland. They stay with us. They work with us. We educate their the children. Uh, those who want to stay forever in Poland, we try to assimilate, give them decent job and perspective to live. So we participate in this uh, huge wave of migrants coming to, to Europe. Mr. Witold Wasztykowski, thank you very, very much indeed. Thank you very much. And so while Poland and other European countries still refuse to take in African migrants, Niger has become the central transit hub for three quarters of migrants attempting to reach Italy. The government has come under pressure from the EU to implement a law criminalizing migrant smuggling and to accept thousands of migrants trapped in Libya's notorious detention centers. We went to the town of Agadez in the center of Niger to speak with some of the people who've been affected by these policies. J'ai perdu mon boulot à cause de l'Europe. Un boulot que j'ai exercé à peu près 16 ans de boulot. Aujourd'hui, une seule fois, il n'y a plus de boulot. C'est une loi que Niger a eu pression, je crois, que, ou bien ils ont eu financement. Tout étant financé par l'Union européenne, 
Donc ils ont pris l'argent, c'est obligé qu'ils qu vont voter la loi. C'est après la loi qu'il y a beaucoup de morts, beaucoup de victimes. Après la loi, ça s'est devenu un business de cachette. Il y a des chauffeurs qui, s'ils si sont en brousse, ils ont senti les militaires, la gendarmerie, ils vont abandonner les immigrants. Ils vont aller jusqu'à la Libye pour se sauver. Donc c'est ça qui a un peu amené beaucoup de morts, d'abandonner les immigrants. majority here have their graduate, university graduate, university certificate. They cannot work, no job, no job opportunity in Africa, Britain, and the France. They are the cause of this problem that is happening here in Africa. Let them use people that they have foresight, the young loot, who will work for us, who will, who, who will open industries for us, for people to work. Mais maintenant, comme la souffrance est trop pour aller en Europe, je n'ai pas réussi. Maintenant, je ne vais plus. Je n'ai plus l'idée pour aller en Europe. J'ai l'idée de rester ici à Gadez pour faire ma restauration. Et si je marche, je resterai ici en Afrique. L'Europe ne veut pas que les Africains qui rentrent clandestinement de rentrer là-bas. Il ne veut pas que les Africains aillent là-bas, chercher un peu de boulot, faire quelque chose. C'est ça, ça peut-être qu'ils ont réfléchi d'arrêter ces Africains-là de venir et de continuer à vivre eux-mêmes. Ouais. Automatiquement, c'est pour leur bien, quoi. C'est pas pour quelque chose. Ou bien c'est pour les gens qui meurent dans les Sahara, les gens meurent dans, le, dans la Méditerranée. Non, ça c'est faux, ça c'est une histoire. C'est parce que les gens n'aillent pas là-bas, n'aillent pas en Europe. C'est pour cela, c'est la seule raison. So are Europe's migration policies saving the lives of migrants attempting the perilous journey to Europe? Or are they creating a, quote, watery graveyard, as Oxfam's EU migration policy advisor has said? To discuss, I'm joined by Emmanuel Matambo, the Southern Voices Network for Peacebuilding Scholar at the Wilson Center's Africa program, and Wendy Williams. She is adjunct research fellow at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies within the US Department of Defense. Welcome to you both. Emmanuel, until last year, the EU had a migration deal with Sudan. It still has one with Niger, with Libya, and soon with Rwanda to keep migrants out of uh, Europe. We know that Niger is going through its own humanitarian crisis. The situation in Libya, of course, being run by warring militias, no central government. Are these places suitable to send migrants to, in your opinion? Unfortunately, they are not. Because if you look at the, the Niger case with all the crisis that has been happening there, I don't think it is a most suitable place for you to send um, immigrants to. And then the case of Libya, especially after 2014, when the government that succeeded the Gaddafi regime virtually collapsed as well, Libya has become very fraught with conflict. So Rwanda, in this case, unfortunately, would be the most ideal place amongst these other countries that are very treacherous for immigrants and, and refugees. And do these countries have any choice but to accept these migrants? I mean, do they have the capacity? Are they overburdened already with their own situations? They are overburdened, especially if you look at the Libyan case at the moment, even Niger itself. But then the thing is that there is a monetary incentive that comes with the EU's plan, the Emergency Trust Fund for Africa. So because of economic desperation, Niger, for example, might be forced to get this money, even if it does not have the capacity. Right. So, Wendy Williams, there is obviously the monetary component, which plays a huge role in all of this. The EU essentially paying these countries many of them in desperate need of this money, to do its, its dirty work, essentially. Is it doing this because of a, an urgent humanitarian need or for its own purely selfish reasons? Well, if you were to look at this from a humanitarian need, you need to put this in context. 
there are 25 million people who are displaced on the continent. What it looks like is that the EU has been really focusing just on the migrants and the smugglers themselves. It would help to look at this as, as sort of a wheel, a cycle of, of um, the symptoms of this irregular migration. And what I mean by irregular migration is people who are traveling without the benefit of regular legal means. So you know, these people do not have passports. They do not have uh, visas. And they, a lot of them, unfortunately, don't have even identification papers or, or cards. They have to use these smugglers to get from point A to point B. And it's this smuggling industry that has uh, become very, there's a lot of money involved in this industry. And it has definitely attracted the attention of um, criminal elements as well as uh, militants, including militants that are in these regions, like in Niger, that are aligned with Al Qaeda or um, ISIS inspired that are wreaking havoc in the area. Uh, the and there are very well documented reports from human rights organizations showing the extent to which some of these groups that you mentioned, other militias uh, running these uh, detention centers in Libya, are committing grave violations of human rights, abuses, torture, uh, violence perpetrated against these migrants. The latest report from the United Nations High Commission for Refugees, I think it was issued on the 20th of September, says that at the moment, actually, the number, at the beginning of September, the number of people in de detention centers was 4,800. It has now risen to 5,300. And 3,900 of those are actually peoples of concern. So that, is, that just tells you the extent right. of, the, of the abuse and the dire conditions in which asylum, and re asylum seekers and refugees are living in. And so these are just the identified people, mm -hmm. the identified refugees. We have no idea how many more refugees mm -hmm. and others, other migrants, are trapped in detention centers, informal detention centers, other conditions of, of um, incarceration. So where does it leave the legal responsibility of European countries? Are they not violating the principle of non-refoulement, which explicitly says this? It prohibits any state from expelling or returning asylum seekers to a place where their safety is at risk. What these migrants are trying to do is actually trying to flee You're right. from Libya, a place where they are being persecuted. Well, at, at the moment, the EU, yes, is partly culpable actually in bringing these people back. And we have to look at how the how the problems and, 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 and the compulsions of, of migration come up in the countries where these people are trying to flee. Especially if you look at Niger. Actually, what has happened in the, in, recently is that most of the migrants who are registered by the UNHCR in Libya currently come from Sudan and Eritrea. And those are countries that are volatile at the moment. It would be inhumane for you to send them back to those countries. It's like the, mm -hmm. the European Union is outsourcing its border management to, to African countries that can barely, barely cope with, uh, with, with, with um, fortifying their borders. And the responsibility partly has to be shared with the African Union because it has, it actually declared 2019 as the year of returnees, refugees, and internally displaced persons. But I'm sorry to say, even up to now, a third of the global population of refugees and migrants still comes from the continent, and they're not being well looked after. So the responsibility isn't squarely on the European Union. The African Union should also share part of the responsibility as well for failing to manage its borders and situations among its member states in terms of conflict and peace. Should it be shared responsibility, Wendy Williams, or do European leaders frankly bear much of the responsibility? Are they essentially complicit? I, I to totally wholeheartedly agree that uh, European countries do bear some uh, do bear responsibility, shared responsibility with their African partners. Uh, right now, African countries are already hosting the majority of displaced people from the continent. The majority of people, African uh, migrants and refugees, are on the continent. In mm -hmm. fact, very few are actually migrating off to Europe. Yeah, so she is, she is very right. There has to be some responsibility because if, if you look at the African Union, and it also has to have a lot of foresight in how exactly do you curb migration, because the, the, the problem itself mutates. All these forces that uh, compel you to immigrate mutate. Climate change also form a part of the contributions towards uh, immigration and uh, refugee status. So, so there are lots of factors that are pushing migrants to leave some of these countries. Now, European leaders constantly say that their policies are not racist that when you have official titles within the European Commission, such as vice president for, quote, protecting our European way of life, 
Does it leave much room for interpretation? Uh, no, it doesn't. I, the European Union has been focused only on one aspect of this whole dilemma, and that is stopping the migrants. Uh, they've, we have seen only uh, money being and resources being put toward border control, security, and diminishing migration, and criminalizing smuggling. There has not been any evidence of addressing the conflicts that are causing a lot of this displacement and the, the weak governance which is causing migrants to have to leave their countries. Wendy Williams and Emmanuel Matambo, thank you both very much indeed. You're welcome. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. And so with migrants continuing to take risks and with the crisis in Niger reaching unprecedented levels, according to the United Nations, at Libya marred in civil war, the EU's policy of relying on fragile African states to keep migrants at bay underscores the bloc's readiness to outsource its response to the so-called migrant crisis at any cost. From me, Rida Fakhri, and all the team here in Washington, thanks for watching. See you next time. Thank you.